Hey everyone, Charles here. Thanks for checking out the channel. This week's video is a replay of a live event that I held earlier this week, taking a look at several CCNP Enterprise topics as they relate to the Encore and Anarsi exams. The attendance and response was huge, so I wanted to make sure that that replay was available for those who couldn't make it live. I also wanted to mention that if you're interested in the CCNP Enterprise certification, or if you're working on CCIE Enterprise infrastructure, for the final time this year, we're holding our Encore 350-401 Masterclass Live. Encore is by far the most popular training that we offer, and this is your last chance in 2022 to attend a live version of this course. I'll be leading you through two weeks of sessions with 18 hours of live training and many other extras included. From now through the end of this month, you can take advantage of our special early bird pricing for a $100 discount on course enrollment, the lowest pricing we've ever offered for this fully featured live Encore prep package. You can find more information about that using the link found here on the screen and in the video description. This offer does end on Tuesday, May 31st. So if CCNP is in your future, I encourage you to take advantage of this special pricing before that expires. Regardless, I hope you enjoy this replay of our CCNP Enterprise Live webcast. Hey, welcome everybody, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining me wherever you're coming from. Uh, glad you're here for our CCNP Enterprise Live event. If we haven't been in a class together, my name is Charles Judd. It's my honor to lead you through some topics today. I absolutely love teaching Encore and Anarsi, some of my favorite courses I've ever made, and I love the topics. I love doing the, the stuff that's included inside those exam curriculums. So it's my pleasure to spend some time with you today, to spend a couple of hours with you. And I do see we have people just from all over the place. That's awesome. I always enjoy scrolling through the chat to see where everybody's from. And I do see people from all over the globe and people are, as a matter of fact, still logging in. So that's incredible. That's awesome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you've chosen to spend a couple of hours out of your day with me. And uh, it's uh, going to be great. It's going to be exciting. We've got lots of topics to talk about. Speaking of which, what is on the agenda for today? Uh, well, and, and by the way, if, if everything's okay, if my audio is good, if someone wouldn't mind to just pop that into the chat roll and let me know, I always like to make sure, uh, I always like to make sure that everything's good there before I get too far into the teaching. So I want to make sure the volume levels are good. And again, I said the agenda, what's on the agenda. So let me talk just a little bit about that. This is a CCNP enterprise event. Now, obviously, we can't cover everything. Those are pretty vast exam curriculums, lots of topics on Encore and Anarsi, but we're going to take a sampler platter from both of those. We're going to talk about some things out of the Encore exam, like um, SD-WAN technology, SD-Access. We're going to look at Syslog. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing audio is good, so that's perfect. Thank you so much for confirming that. Uh, we're going to look at NetFlow. We'll look at IPSLA. Uh, we'll look at... Uh, a lot of the first hour will be a lot of theory. And then after the second hour, we'll get into a lot more configuration, mostly configuration in the second hour. When we look at things like IPSLA, we're going to move into a NARSI topics, look at a lot of BGP features. We'll look at states and timers, BGP multi-hop, route reflectors, path summarization, and those types of things. So we've got a lot to cover. Let me get my slides up and going for us here. And as I said, we're going to start out here with some uh, some theory out of the Encore exam, and we're going to start with an overview of SD-WAN technology. Enterprise SD-WAN connections were designed to interconnect main, office, uh, main offices with the branch locations so that resource sharing could take place. And that allowed for sharing access to centrally located resources, such as the data itself or the services or the applications. And traditionally speaking, dedicated circuits were used to achieve this through connectivity such as MPLS or frame relay circuits. Now, although these provided reliability, they did provide security for the connection. Our modern networks, they require us to kind of rethink this, right? Because one of the big reasons is cloud usage. Cloud usage is on the rise. And so we need ways to simplify the way that we manage our wide area networks which is why SD-WAN, or, or in other words, software-defined WAN, that's why this is on the rise. As the name suggests, SD-WAN uses software, of course, to control and manage interactions between branch locations and central resources. 
Now, when we're looking at the function of SD-WAN, one of the big advantages offered is that there's no longer the need for what we call backhauling the traffic. If we take a look at a very simplified topology here, just to get an example of this, you can see we have a branch location that's connected over MPLS, a traditional WAN connection method, and it's connected back to the data center. At the data center, we have some advanced security inspection happening. So in this traditional WAN setup, all the traffic from the branch gets backhauled back to the data center for those security services. That would include traffic that is destined to the cloud or the public internet and traffic destined locally within the organization as well. Now you can probably imagine that can cause all kinds of different performance issues. It can cause delay depending on your circuit speeds and even bandwidth issues on MPLS connections. SD-WAN addresses this through its ability to interact with all different kinds of cloud applications. So more and more, we know our cloud applications are, or pardon me, our applications are moving to cloud-based solutions. Think about how cheap and easy AWS storage is now and how Office 365, that's turned into a cloud platform for enterprise email. SD-WAN can easily interact with applications like AWS, Dropbox, Azure, Office 365, and many, many more. So that means that hosting applications in either public or private clouds will allow direct traffic between the cloud app and the branch location, rather than having to backhaul all of that traffic through a central data center. So that's a big reason why we're moving more and more toward SD-WAN. Now there are obviously other reasons, but that's a big one. SD-WAN solutions can intelligently control the path of traffic in a way that we can optimize the traffic flow and help to reduce unnecessary bandwidth in our network. Now, you may be wondering, what happens to the security inspection services that we typically saw at the data center. Now that our traffic is routed through that, what happens? Well, that's been addressed as well. Since most SD-WAN offerings now provide end-to-end -end encryption and inspection services. Additionally, more and more next generation features are being added. Things like anti-malware systems and botnet intervention, many features that you would see on next generation security devices. Another big advantage of SD-WAN solutions is that they provide what we call traffic transport independence. So in order to understand that, we wanna understand the difference in an overlay network and an underlay network. An underlay network is what we see here. It's simply the physical network infrastructure that's responsible for the delivery of packets. SD-WAN, that's a type of overlay network which is a virtual network. When we're talking about an overlay network, we're typically talking about a virtual network built on top of the underlay network or on top of the actual physical infrastructure. Overlay networks, that's not something that's new. They've been around for a very, very long time. Overlay networks even include things like voice, uh, voice over IP, virtual private networks. Both of those can run on top of the internet. So with SD-WAN, as the overlay network, this gives us the transport independence that I mentioned. And, and by that, we mean that our WAN connections, they can be made up of all different types of connection combinations. We might have some LTE connections. We might have serial connections, uh, wireless, MPLS. It doesn't matter what's running on the underlay network because SD-WAN solutions can coherently choose the best data transmission path. And so that's great news for us as network administrators because it just simplifies our job even further. So now that we kind of understand what SD-WAN is and, and why it's increasingly useful in modern enterprise networks, let's look specifically at Cisco's SD-WAN solution because in terms of the Encore exam, you do want to know specifically about that. And so we're going to specifically examine Cisco's base solution for this, which is the Cisco SD-WAN, and that's based on Viptela. Cisco acquired the Viptela company in 2017, and that provides a cloud-based SD-WAN solution. This is recommended to be used in conjunction with Cisco's DNA center in order to leverage automation and virtualization capabilities. 
Now within SD-WAN, we can break this down into four planes of operation. The, these three main planes may be very familiar to you. If you're any, uh, if you're familiar with networking at all, these are our typical planes that we talk about, our planes of operation, the data plane, the control plane, and the management plane. Those are from traditional networking models. And we have a fourth plane known as the orchestration plane. So there are also four different solutions within Cisco SD-WAN that have been created to manage each of these four planes of operation. First, we have Cisco vManage. vManage, very simply, is the GUI interface for managing the SD-WAN solution. So this is where you perform your configuration, you could do monitoring from there, and device provisioning. Then there's Cisco vBond, which controls the orchestration plane. It is the job of the Cisco vBond solution to understand how the network is constructed and to make sure that all of the interconnected components have the ability to work together. And one of the big capabilities with vBond is something we call zero touch provisioning, which you can imagine means that we don't have to touch a device when we provision it. We can, if we have a SD-WAN capable router, as an example, and we introduce that into the network, then Cisco vBond can remotely provision that router from anywhere without the need for us to connect to that and to take any action at all. So it's a really, really cool feature. Next, we have Cisco vSmart. This resides in the control plane, and we typically think of this as the brains of the SD-WAN solution. As we create policies through vManage, as an administrator creates those, the vSmart component here, it's going to be responsible for the actual enforcement of the policies. These policies would also be shared with other SD-WAN routers and locations. Routes from branch locations are going to be received via the Overlay Management Protocol, OMP. vSmart can use the known policies against those routes to control traffic flow throughout the SD-WAN fabric. And finally, in the data plane, we have WAN edge routers themselves which are responsible for establishing the network and for forwarding the traffic. These devices can be either physical or virtual, or we can also have a combination of both types of those devices. So let's talk about a common way that this might be implemented. Here you can see uh, another very simplified sample topology where we have a main campus location. We have a couple of branch locations as well. We have a physical data center and a cloud data center maybe. And all of these are interconnected through all kinds of various means. We see MPLS here, LTE, satellite connections, creating a network of all these sites. Now, again, remember, SD-WAN is our overlay technology. It provides transport independence. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the underlying network infrastructure is. As we see here, SD-WAN can work with any of that. Each of these locations would have an uh, a WAN edge router, pardon me, and these routers are going to form IPsec tunnels with each other in order to create the SD-WAN overlay fabric, the overlay network, and that makes up the data plane that we discussed a bit earlier. Also recall all of the control elements that we discussed earlier, vManage, vBond, and vSmart, remember those? Secure control channels, are going to be established between each of these elements and each WAN edge router. And that would be used for provisioning and configuration in a secure manner. Now, as for the edge routers themselves, as we mentioned, those can be either a hardware or a software platform. If we're talking about hardware platforms, that could be things like uh, Cisco V edge routers running on the Viptela operating system and certain integrated services routers and aggregation service router models as well. Virtual platforms would include the vEdge cloud router running Viptela OS and the cloud services router models running iOS XE SD-WAN software. So that's a look at Cisco's SD-WAN based on Viptela and how we might commonly see that in, uh, implemented into an enterprise network. Let's talk about SD access technology now. 
We talked about the merits of software-defined networking briefly already and how that kind of helps to simplify the management and the configuration of our infrastructure. And so Cisco is kind of taking that one step farther with something they call software-defined access or SD access. So let's run down a few advantages provided by software-defined access. Starting with the features of Cisco's DNA Center. Cisco DNA Center is a key piece of the SD access solution. And, and that acts as a central point of management that's able to automate the deployment and the configuration of our networking devices. With SD access and with Cisco DNA Center, network device configuration, of course, uh, that becomes automated, whether you're deploying one or multiple new devices in the network. DNA Center works as, as we said, a central point of that. And it simplifies our network maintenance and our setup because of that. It allows for super fast deployments. Now, policy enforcement, that's another improvement offered by SD Access. Rather than relying on traditional access control groups, SD Access uses something called Security Group Access Control Lists, or SGACLs. Now, you, we can think of these as sort of like a group-based policy that are much, much more scalable. If you think about a traditional ACL, those rely on IP addresses and subnets, and those can quickly become complicated to maintain. Or if we're trying to scale those out for a larger network, it can become really, really confusing. But the SGACLs used by SD Access, they overcome that through group policies that are based on a client's identity rather than their IP address. So we can have identity groups. So we might have an identity group, let's say for help desk and an identity group for accounting. And the ACLs can be applied in that manner rather than having to do that by IP address, which again can get complex if we're trying to branch out or enlarge our network or change it in any way. Going in ha uh, hand in hand with this is the ability to securely segment the network in a very simple manner. Since SD access sees the entire infrastructure, both wired and wireless, as a single network fabric, it's very easy to segment the network without the need for various firewalls or for complicated access control lists. And network virtualization, that's another big plus for SD access. And that allows for our single physical infrastructure to be separated into multiple virtual networks. Each of these virtual networks can have their own set of access policies created and enforced through SD Access. We can break down the SD Access solution itself into two main components, Cisco DNA Center, which we've already mentioned, that gives us automation, that gives us orchestration throughout the network, and something else called the Campus Fabric. Uh, remember earlier we talked about the underlay and the overlay networks? Well, the underlay network, of course, is our physical infrastructure. And the campus fabric, that's another example of an overlay network. That's specifically a Cisco, uh, Cisco overlay network. The campus fabric solution is ideally used with Cisco DNA Center. So the campus fabric ideally manages the network through DNA Center. Now we can also do that through CLI or through API, through NetConf protocol, through Yang modeling language. But the reason Campus Fabric was developed is to overcome traditional campus network issues, things like spanning tree and layer two forwarding. And it's an improvement over architectures such as the three tier architecture or spine and leaf. So Campus Fabric we can think of that as a next generation campus network where management and configuration is, is basically simplified. So let's look at this in a graphical example where we again see our underlay network, our actual physical underlay network, and we see the campus fabric overlay network here as well. The campus fabric, that gives us network segmentation. It gives us security features. And it does that through policy-based security groups that we mentioned earlier. The security provided here goes beyond traditional routing and switching and also beyond traditional security capabilities as well. And it can leverage Cisco's identity services engine for contextual user information and security policies. Now, we already mentioned 
The Campus Fabric Overlay can be configured through the CLI or through the API, or we can fully automate that through DNA Center. So you can use a Campus Fabric solution and you can manually configure that. You can absolutely do that without using DNA Center. However, this is not considered to be SD access. SD access, at least according to Cisco, is specifically defined as being fully automated with DNA Center. If DNA Center is not used, then all you have is a campus fabric solution, not a software defined access solution. So just some wording that you should be aware of. So that's in terms of the Encore exam itself. That's how Cisco defines this. So you do want to know that. So if we're talking about SD access, we're talking about both a campus fabric solution and Cisco DNA Center. Now you're probably not going to be surprised to learn here that we also have three planes of operation in the SD access fabric. We have the control plane, the data plane, and the policy plane. So let's talk about these. The policy plane, that's based on Cisco TrustSec. TrustSec helps to create the security groupings that we mentioned earlier so that policies are going to be based on identities rather than maybe IP addressing schemes. The SD access control plane is based on something called the locator ID separation protocol or LISP. LISP is simply an addressing architecture that Cisco developed and that's a variation of node addressing. So rather than having a single numbered address identifier, and when I say that I'm talking about something like maybe an IP address. So rather than using that, Lisp creates two addresses for each node. It has an address for its identity and another address for the location where it's found in the network. So this is kind of a way to simplify traditional routing and to streamline that. And then of course we have the data plane that leverages a tunneling technology called Virtual Extensible LAN or VXLAN. This encapsulation is what creates the SD access overlay fabric. This is UDP based communication. So you do want to know that. And that means because it's UDP based, any IP capable device can forward that information. So VXLAN, uh, that encapsulation allows not only for layer three overlay networks, but also for creating separate virtual network instances where we can have separate policies applied in a forest. And so you want to know that the control plane uses LISP data encapsulation, while the data plane uses VXLAN encapsulation. Both of these are important encapsulations that you want to know about and remember. So let's look at this now. And if we break down a typical topology structure in a visual manner for the SD access architecture, we're going to see four distinct layers here. We can see at the bottom, probably exactly what you would expect is our physical layer. We're going to have things like our actual infrastructure devices, routers, wireless infrastructure, switches, maybe a DNA center appliance, maybe a Cisco ICE appliance. The next layer is our network layer. And in here, we're going to see our underlay and our overlay networks. The underlay network would include the settings and the protocols used in the physical infrastructure for transporting those data packets. And the overlay network, as we've mentioned, is a virtual network that's going to form a fabric of its own, a simplified fabric. And as we saw in our earlier topology, that's going to strip out some of the limitations and the complexities of our network. And it's going to make a much more simplified network fabric. The tunneling is performed again using VXLAN encapsulation here. Then we have a layer called the controller layer. This is going to consist of Cisco DNA Center and Cisco ICE appliances, Identity Services Engine. We can break down Cisco DNA Center itself into two main structures here, and we do want to know about this for the Encore exam. Those are Cisco Network Control Platform and Cisco Network Data Platform. Cisco N uh, NCP, the Network Control Platform, that's used for automation and orchestration of our physical and network layers while Cisco NDP, Network Data Platform, that's used to collect analytics and to gather historical trends, and it's used by the management layer and also by Cisco ICE. Cisco ICE, of course, is for identity and security services, 
And that's the piece that identifies and places our users into policy groups. Again, we're looking at Cisco recommendations here. So this is recommended to be deployed with the Cisco ICE to take care of those security groupings. And that allows the policies to be forced throughout the fabric. The fourth layer is our management layer. That is the Cisco DNA Center user interface. That's what we think of at this layer. And that essentially is a centralized dashboard that allows us to view and control the entire network through intent-based networking. Now, the unique thing here is that Cisco DNA Center provides a really simple GUI tool for management and deployment, which means you don't necessarily have to know how to configure each individual network device in order to use the Cisco DNA Center deployment method. Now, that has given a lot of people pause over the years. I can remember when DNA Center was first introduced, uh, there was a lot of maybe fear and doubt in the networking industry. People afraid that they were going to lose their jobs, afraid that um, the, these types of automation was going to take away from network engineers. And uh, Cisco has uh, vehemently denied this, and I, I definitely don't see this happening anytime. Uh, I think we're completely safe, although DNA Center is one of the most easy solution Cisco's ever offered as far as GUIs go. Nothing is going to take the place of having the network knowledge. You may be able to go in there and click around and do some things, but you really should know what you're doing if you're going to do that. So uh, network engineers, I, I think we're here to stay. We, we work in conjunction, hand in hand with things like automation. So never fear about that. Now, let's go here to our... Next slide, our SD access implementation here and talk about a sample of what this might look like when we're implementing this. At the bottom, we have our end user devices. Those are both wired and wireless clients here. And this, the first piece of the implementation that we want to examine as far as the SD access implementation outside of our client devices is the fabric edge nodes. This is the layer that provides user access through wired or wireless connections. Not only does this provide a connection point, but this is also where identity and authentication for the users take place. Remember we talked about Cisco TrustSec and Cisco ICE leveraged to enforce security policies and to place users into the appropriate access groups in the network. That happens here. These devices sit on the edge of our SD access fabric. We also have what are referred to as fabric intermediate nodes. So these are simply internal routers uh, or switches even that are part of the underlay infrastructure. They have no specific role in SD access other than providing underlay services. And again, that's our actual infrastructure, our actual routing through protocols like OSPF or EIGRP, for example. Remember that underlay network isn't dependent on any specific protocol. We can have a mixture of protocols. We can have a mixture of wired and wireless as well. Then we have what's called the fabric control plane node. Remember our previous discussion on how the control plane uses LISP encapsulation to map those nodes. Again, LISP contains two namespaces for each node, as we mentioned, an, uh, an ID, an endpoint identifier, and a routing locator, an RLOC. So this uh, particular node that we see here, this would essentially be a LISP server containing a database, and that would resolve the IDs to the, loc to the routing locators, to the RLOCs, and it would map those nodes within the network. The fabric, uh, pardon me, the fabric edge nodes that we talked about earlier, they would provide information from connected clients to create and update those mappings. And that Lisp server, that fabric control plane node would resolve the lookups from those nodes as well. So uh, now I'll also say you want a fairly robust device to act as your fabric control plane node, that particular device, because all of our mappings are kept here. Uh, so the software and hardware requirements when choosing that particular node, you want to be sure they're pretty robust. And then we have on the right-hand side, you see the fabric border node. Uh, these are essential, essentially LISP 
proxy tunnel routers that allow, uh, they allow for external layer three connectivity to the SD access fabric. They can communicate policy and identity information between separate domains, maybe out to remote offices or data centers. And then there are three types of fabric border nodes as well. We have the internal border node, default border node, and anywhere border nodes. Internal, that refers to, uh, we refer to that as the rest of the company. That connects only to known areas of the organization. So that might be a local data center. It might be a wireless LAN controller. That might be a firewall, any of those things. The default border node, or in other words, the outside border nodes, they connect only to unknown external networks like the public internet or the public cloud. So we would config, uh, these would be configured with a default route getting us to the outside world. And anywhere border nodes, as you may guess, they offer connectivity both inside the organization and outside to the public internet. We can see our fabric control plane and our fabric border nodes here connected up to our on-site server room that would of course contain our Cisco DNA center and our Cisco identity services engine appliances. And we see a wireless LAN controller up there as well. Now this requires you to have fabric capable wireless LAN components. That means we have to have specific access points and wireless LAN controllers made for SD access if we want to do that. Now, I also want to point out when we're talking about wireless, one difference is that with traditional wireless, it's very common to see a centralized topology in an enterprise network. And when I say that, I mean, maybe we have a wireless LAN controller that's connected centrally back to the network infrastructure somewhere. And that has access points maybe dispersed throughout different physical buildings. So in this model that we see here in our traditional model, all of the control plane and the data plane traffic from wireless clients, it gets tunneled through the wireless LAN controller. If you remember CCNA studies, if you've had those, it uses CAPWAP tunnels because the wireless LAN controller handles all of that. Now we know that with SD access, the data plane is distributed using VXLAN. We've already covered that. So in an SD access wireless deployment, a fabric access point will establish a VXLAN tunnel with a fabric edge node, rather than establishing a CAPWAP tunnel all the way back to the wireless LAN controller. Now, in order to do that, the AP must be directly connected to the fabric edge node for that to be possible. So the VXLAN tunnel what is that used for? Well, that's used to carry data from the access point to the SD access fabric, where our overlay network can then direct the traffic as needed. And that's much more efficient and scalable as well, because the traffic doesn't always have to be carried all the way back to the main controller before it's routed elsewhere. Now, the control plane traffic that is still carried back to the wireless LAN controller. And that is still done using CAPWAP encapsulated inside of a VX LAN tunnel. So you do still get the advantages of using SD access fabric to carry the control plane traffic to the controller. So another example, if you remember when we talked about traffic backhauling, uh, another good example of why that works well with wireless networks, we're not having to haul to, pardon me, to backhaul all of our wireless traffic all the way back to our wireless LAN controller with this model. Instead, we use that VX LAN tunnel to route that into our overlay network, which can then intelligently forward that as needed. So that's a look at how SD access might be commonly implemented in an enterprise environment and how that interacts with also traditional physical networking devices to improve our networks. Now, as we said, we do have a little bit more theory here, and then we're eventually going to jump into some uh, hands-on configuration for the latter half of this course. But uh, I will also mention here that when we're talking about SD access, one thing I almost forgot, this is of course all managed and orchestrated and monitored 
by Cisco DNA Center. It gives us a GUI interface where we can create policies, we can subdivide our networks into virtual instances, and we can have an automated control platform that helps us with configuration and provisioning. Now, next thing up on our slate, let's talk about syslog theory. That's something that's found in the Encore Blueprint. We do need to know about the syslog protocol. So syslog is another method that we could use for transporting event messages between our managed devices and systems. That's been around for a long time. It was standardized way back in 2009, RFC 5424. Syslog is widely supported on most major operating systems, including almost all versions of Linux, Unix, Mac OS, and Windows-based systems. Now, if you're familiar with NTP, Network Time Protocol, you understand the importance of proper time sync and configuration so that all of our devices are synchronized. And when we're using syslog, that's definitely a very, very important consideration. We have to have those time-stamped syslog messages that correlate if we're going to troubleshoot properly. We're going to have very, very inaccurate reporting if that's not the case. It's gonna make our job much harder when we're trying to correlate logs and examine any events that happen in our network. One of the best practices for implementing syslog is to store our collected log messages on a centralized server. Some of those popular options, and there are lots and lots of options out there, but there are things like Kiwi by SolarWinds, PRTG and Splunk, just to name a few. Now, again, there are many, many different options out there, but the advantage of using a centralized tool is they gather syslog records from all of the devices throughout the entire network and they give us the ability to easily correlate the logs. What do I mean by correlation? Well, correlation means that if we have something happens in our network, we have a security event, or let's say a server goes down, we can go through the logs, and instead of having to log into each individual device and dig through the logs and look through the timestamps, these centralized syslog servers will correlate all that information for us. It will give us a single picture of what's happened in our network. And that's super helpful, a great way to investigate anything that might be happening. Now, correlation, again, one of the foundations for effective log analysis. Different tools are going to perform that in all kinds of different ways, but the overall function is that they pare down the amount of information that we have to dig through and the amount of information being presented to us. If we have again, a really large event in our network, we can have a ton of syslog messages. And those can be generated by almost every device. They can be sent to our server. And so correlation helps us to recognize redundant information and gives us a quick way we can sort and view what's happening much, much more efficiently. Now, one thing you wanna be familiar with regarding syslog are of course the message severity levels. By default, we have eight severity levels numbered zero through seven. You can see those reflected here in this table and the corresponding definition for each level. Level zero syslog events would be the most critical. Those are emergency events indicating an unstable system. And then at the other end, we have level seven syslog events, which are informational debug messages that would be used for troubleshooting. We also have a way to represent which system process created a syslog event, which we call syslog facilities. So you can see a list of those available here. And again, those are outlined in RFC 5424, if you need to dig into that further. So these tell us if the message was created, for example, by the mail system with facility number two. The RFC standard outlines the three different layers found within the syslog standard which is the syslog content itself, the syslog application, and the syslog transport. The content layer, of course, refers to the information that is found within the syslog message itself. The syslog application is what generates and stores the syslog message, and the syslog transport layer is used to send the message over the network somewhere. If we look at the format of a typical syslog message, we're gonna have three main parts to that. 
we can see the PRI, the header, and the message itself. So let's talk about those. The PRI, or in other words, the, the priority, that contains the facility and the severity code. The facility code is going to be listed first, followed by the severity code. So in this example, we see a, uh, a, pardon me, a facility code of 10 that identifies this as a security message, followed by a critical level zero emergency indicator. Next, we see the header, and that's composed of two different fields. We see the timestamp at which the event was recorded, and we see the host name, with this host name being that of the machine that generated the syslog message. And the third part is the message contents themselves. This contains the actual information about what has happened. This contains, uh, again, information about anything that has happened to occur on the network, and it's going to be broken down into two main parts, the tag and the content. The tag will contain codes that are going to be about which particular application and process ID is related to the event, and the content is going to be the actual message output. Uh, I also mentioned that syslog services use UDP port 514 for communication by default. So that's an important port that you want to know about. If you're having trouble with syslog, UDP 514 is a great place to start. Now, let's take a look at NetFlow here as well. While I pull up, pardon me just one moment, I'll pull up my next set of notes here. And I'll tell you, yeah, there we go. So another one of those important protocols that we want to know about is, of course, NetFlow. NetFlow, as you can see, that collects IP traffic information. And NetFlow, that was created by Cisco. It's very popular. And this type of visibility that it gives us into the network allows us to better understand exactly how the network is behaving. So some of the things it helps us identify. It helps us identify network bottlenecks. So we can use NetFlow statistics to find things like the top talkers in our network. In other words, the devices that might be using the most bandwidth or resources. Uh, if we're looking for slow network performance, if we're troubleshooting that, we can often trace that back to devices that are overutilizing bandwidth. So this is a great way we can identify that. Also, issues related to policy changes or any new applications introduced in the network. We can see what type of load uh, adding a new service. Maybe we're adding voice over IP service to the infrastructure and we can measure how that affects our traffic flows. We can detect unauthorized or problematic traffic as well. That can include things like end users unnecessarily utilizing maybe streaming services or social media and causing congestion. I've definitely seen that happen before in my help desk days. We can also use NetFlow to identify security vulnerabilities and anomalies in our network. Things like worm detection, that's possible using NetFlow data. Now, it's important to understand how NetFlow gives you network information. So in order to do that, we first need to understand what an IP flow is. Flow is where the term comes, uh, uh, pardon me, the term, <laughs> the term flow in the NetFlow name, where does that come from? What does that mean? An IP flow is unidirectional traffic, or in other words, traffic going into a single direction. So if we look at traffic crossing a router in a single direction, we have traffic that's going into a port and destined for a public web server, for instance. Netflix, uh, not Netflix, NetFlow is going to examine each packet for a set of attributes and these attributes are what we often refer to as the packet fingerprint. When we're talking about NetFlow, similar packets are going to be grouped together based on their fingerprints, and that's what we group into a flow. That's what we call a flow. The attributes that NetFlow uses to group these packets together, what are they? Well, those are the IP source and destination address, the source and destination port, the layer three protocol type, the router or switch interface, and the type of service associated with the packet. So NetFlow can capture also on the ingress and egress. In other words, traffic coming into a port 
or traffic exiting a port, depending on how we've configured that. All of the packets that have attributes in common are again going to be grouped together into a flow. They're going to be condensed and they're going to be placed into a database on the router called the NetFlow cache. This would remain, or I'm part, this would uh, contain the flow information. And by flow information, again, I'm talking about all those attributes we pointed out earlier that we can see. And it's also going to include things like the total number of packets in the flow and the bytes per packet. And once that's in our router's NetFlow cache, we have two primary ways that we can access this information. We're actually going to look at this in our CLI in just a bit. We can access that through the CLI, of course, very simply using show commands. And that's useful if you're in need maybe of some immediate information while you're actively troubleshooting. But obviously, if we're talking about the router's cache, our cache on, the, on our routers, they're relatively small. So our information is going to be limited there as far as what we can keep in an historical perspective. It's not going to have a really long view backwards. So it's not ideal. It does have its place and it's great for active troubleshooting. But if we really want to have effective NetFlow in our network, then what we want is a NetFlow collector. That's the second and primary way that we can view this information. A NetFlow collector is a device that's responsible for receiving, interpreting, and storing flow records. We could configure our router to export the NetFlow records from the cache out to a NetFlow collector. And these collectors have the ability to read and analyze the data and make very detailed and intuitive reports. It can give us visual graphs in a visual manner, tools like PRTG that we've talked about. You can see an output from that here and what that looks like. It allows us to monitor our LAN, WAN, VPN, individual application traffic, really great detailed reporting, uh, reporting and alerting. Now, when we're using a NetFlow collector, on average, 30 to 50 flows are bundled together and transported over UDP to the NetFlow collector, where the collector can analyze in real time and provide, again, that historical data. Now, based on the NetFlow version, the format of the exported data is going to vary slightly. We have two main versions that I want to mention. We have version five. Version five is by far the most popular format used out there today. And the reason is that it is a fixed format. It never changes. So it's easier to read for most NetFlow collection, especially if we're talking about older devices and older reporting packages. And that, again, that uses a fixed format. And we also have NetFlow version nine. That's the most recent format that is recommended by Cisco. That brings better security and analysis. The ability also to accurately report on multicast traffic as well. The format for NetFlow version nine, pardon me, change slides too quick. The format for NetFlow version nine, that is dynamic. And so that does require what we call NetFlow version nine templates. Now, these templates are going to be sent to the collector periodically in order to inform the collector what format the data is being sent to it in so that the correct interpretation can happen. So that's an overview of basically what NetFlow is and how we can have advantages when we're using it on our network. But let's take a look here at how we can actually configure NetFlow. We're going to jump out into a CLI here. So let me get us out. And actually, before I do that, let me go full screen with our topology so I can actually show you what we're working at. So we're going to take a look at how we can use NetFlow on a Cisco router. In this case, it's going to be R1. You can see we have a subnet of hosts here on the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network. Those are connected to gig zero slash one on the switch or um, pardon me on the router by way of the switch. And on the other side of our router, our gig zero slash two interface is connected to a NetFlow collector. Now, as I've mentioned, that collector could be any number of tools that are available, SolarWinds, PRTG, just to name a couple. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to configure our ingress interface. In other words, our incoming interface to capture NetFlow on gig zero slash one on the router. 
we'll take a look at our local NetFlow cache that I mentioned, which is one way to view that. And then we'll look at how to configure the router to export those records. And we're gonna export those to the IP address we see in this topology, our NetFlow collector, 192.168.10.5. So let's do it. Let's go out to router one here. And I'm connected into router one. Let's first go under global configuration mode on this router. And if we say IP flow hyphen export and take a look at our contextual help options, you can see that under here, we have the option to choose uh, the version, the very bottom option. We can say version, so let's do that. And also take a look at our options. So we see one, five, and nine available. Now, now I, I will specifically point out that uh, versions five and nine. Version one is obsolete. That's limited to IPv4 without network masks and without autonomous system numbers. I mentioned version five is by far the most popular because of legacy support and the fact that the format of the exported data is always the same. So many older collectors can handle that very easily. And I also mentioned it's Cisco's recommendation to use version nine. It adds a lot of features that we discussed in our theory portion. So let's do that. Let's say version nine here. And now once I hit enter, we want to now go under the interface where we want to capture the NetFlow data itself. And we'll go under the interface here, under interface gig zero slash one. If you look at our topology, at the top of our screen, that is the ingress interface for our router that's getting us to the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 subnet where our hosts are. Now, once we're under this interface, we can say IP flow. Let's look at our contextual help options. And the two I'll point out here are ingress and egress. We also have monitor. Now the monitor flow that's used with something called flexible net flow. In this example, we're gonna actually configure both of the remaining options. We're gonna configure uh, this particular router to be able to capture data related to traffic, both coming from and going to the host subnet. So let's say IP flow ingress, and then we'll also say IP flow egress as well. And that's it, simple as that. Now NetFlow is going to capture data from this interface and it's gonna store it in the local NetFlow cache. So let me break out of here and let's take a look at this configuration. Let's verify, let's say show IP flow interface. And this command is going to show us every interface where we've configured NetFlow collection. So in our case, of course, that is only on the gig zero slash one interface. And we can see we've got that for both ingress and egress traffic. Now, just to make sure that we actually have some traffic crossing that interface, let's go over to our PCs and let's ping our router from each of these. So on PC one, I'm gonna ping 10.1.1.1. Make sure that resolves, yep. Do it on PC2, PC3. That looks good. Let's go back here and let's say show IP cache flow. That's the command we want to run. And so remember, if we don't configure a net flow export, this information is only going to be stored in our local NetFlow cache. Again, you can do this even with a NetFlow collector configured. Even if you have a NetFlow collector configured, you can still look at the local cache. If you're looking for some immediate troubleshooting, some immediate information in the CLI view, but not great for a historical perspective. So let's talk about what we're seeing here. Let me scroll up just a bit. And one thing I'll point out, the first thing you might notice is the IP packet size distribution. So we had 12 total packets. If we go back to one of my PCs, you'll see I had four exclamation points. The first one did not resolve and the next four did. So it took one attempt to resolve that IP address. Then we had four successes from each of our PCs, PC one, two, and three. 
That's why we see 12 total packets here. And we see the distribution. We see a strange little table here. What exactly is this telling us? Well, if you remember the size of ICMP messages, by default, those are 100 bytes in size. So this is actually showing us the distribution of the size of our packets. And you'll see that this 1.00, that means 100%. So 100% of our packets are listed between 96 bytes and 128 bytes. These are 100 byte ICMP messages. So this is exactly what we would expect to see. So just wanted to point that out. That's what we're actually seeing here. Let's uh, complete our output a little bit more here. And you'll see that we have some active flows. Uh, if I scroll up just a bit, two active flows at the time that I actually ran the show command. So these active flows do disappear fairly quickly. We have three flows added. Um, we see that we scroll down here. We can see our source IP addresses. We see our destination IP addresses, which is of course us. And so that looks good. All things we would expect to see. That's what our local NetFlow cache looks like. Now, uh, as, uh, although we only have three hosts, the we're going to see we only have, or pardon me, three active flows. We are going to see more actual added flows than that. We're going to see a higher number. And why is that? Why are those numbers different? Well, we have three active flows, but we have inactive flows, as it says, times out in 15 seconds. So if we run this command again, as a matter of fact, let's say show IP cache flow. Now you'll see we have zero active flows three flows added. So we help add these time out fairly quickly. Inactive flows time out in 15 seconds. So uh, after, and, and as a matter of fact, even the uh, inactive flows, those are going to time out after 30 minutes as a way to keep the net flow cache clear and to, and to keep it recent. So if we do want to see our active flows, we need to have fairly recent and active traffic, maybe a continuous ping or if we're simulating this in a lab as I'm doing here, we want to be pretty quick with our show command to capture that. So um, if we go back to our previous output, as a matter of fact, yeah, because this one, we see three flows added. Let's go back up to this other output. And let me show, well, before we do that, let me show you how to clear this. We can actually manually clear the NetFlow cache by saying clear IP flow stats. If we hit enter, now we say show IP cache flow. Our packet distribution is empty and our table is empty. Let's go to our PCs again, arrow up and ping one more time on each of those. And then we'll quickly take a look at our IP cache flow stats. And we do see all of our IP addresses listed in here. So that's good. That's how we take a look at our local NetFlow cache and how we can configure NetFlow. Now, if we, let me clear this out again before we move forward. If we want to export our NetFlow data to an external collector, that's very easy to do as well. Let's go under global configuration mode and let's say IP flow hyphen export contextual help is going to show us that we have a keyword destination that we can use. That's going to allow us to point to a collection server. So let's use that followed by the IP address for our collection server. In this lab, you can see that is 192.168.10.5. And if we look at contextual help again, you can see that we need to indicate a port number. And there are several common UDP ports used by default, depending on the collector software that you're using. I'm just going to use 9995. In this case, some of those common ports include things like 2055, 9995, 9996, but there are several ports over which those collectors are going to typically listen. So you want to make sure you check with your collector software and your collection server to make sure what it needs when you're listening on this. So let me, once again, 
jump back to one of my hosts, quickly ping my router again, and then run my show command here again, show IP, actually I wanna run show IP flow export. Notice we're using a different show command this time, show IP flow export. So this is specifically going to show stats being exported to our collector. We may have to run that a couple of times. And we do see here two flows exported in one UDP datagram. And again, why are we seeing two flows exported, by the way? that Remember, that's because a flow is unidirectional traffic, right? It's traffic in one direction. So we see those because our traffic is unidirectional. We have flows in both directions. So we would also be able, in this output, we would be able to see any sort of issues we're having. We would be able to see if we were having fragmentation or any other issues. We can see that flow export version nine is enabled for the main cache. We see our destination, IP address, along with our destination port number as well. Now on the collector side of things, the collector itself isn't something you need to know about for the Encore exam, but the collector side of course would aggregate all of that data, it would sort it, give us really nice graphical outputs to help us interpret exactly what's happening in our network. So that's a look at how we can capture NetFlow data to our local NetFlow cache, and also how we can export data to an external NetFlow collector. We're gonna talk about IPSLA. We'll talk about the theory of IPSLA, and then we're going to configure that as well. So let's jump into that. IPSLA, uh, in other words, IP service level agreements, that's a feature built into Cisco's iOS that gives us a way to monitor network performance. So this is an active method for monitoring and reporting, and it has the ability to report on our traffic in real time. Metrics that IPSLA has the ability to report on. You can see some of those listed here. Uh, those metrics include things like connectivity, delay, jitter, packet loss, and sequencing response times, lots of things. So it's a very common tool for service providers and where they use to monitor customer sites. It's a helpful way that we can set up to be able to troubleshoot our topologies as well. Now, one of the benefits of IPSLA is it doesn't require a physical probe in order to monitor performance. It simply uses generated traffic to measure the performance of a network between devices. So configuring IPSLA, it's gonna require an IPSLA source and optionally a responder. So let's talk about the source. The IPSLA source is going to generate packets and send those to a destination device somewhere else on the network. This can be as simple as an ICMP echo used to continuously test reachability of a remote device. The response from the remote device, uh, that response is going to be, it's going, pardon me, it's going to contain timestamp information and it's going to contain other things as well. Uh, things, sorry about that. I'm having a little glitch on my side. There we go. My slides seem to freeze up for just a moment. Pardon me. Uh, the IPSLA source is gonna include timestamps, is going to include certain network metrics that might be of interest. Now, optionally, we can have a Cisco router configured as an IPSLA responder. This would allow the device to respond to more advanced IPSLA request packets. Some IPSLA operations will work without a responder, such as ICMP or HTTP. Now, in order for IPSLA to be effective, it leverages SNMP traps triggered by events such as connection loss or jitter or latency. Any IPSLA metric, we can set thresholds for those. So for example, we might set a threshold that we want for a specific round trip time metric. And if our IPSLA detected a threshold violation, in other words, if the round trip uh, traffic time was higher than our configured upper limit, then an SNMP trap would be sent out to alert an administrator. Also, threshold violations can be used to trigger other IPSLA operations. So we might have maybe the frequency of a probe might be increased 
an additional and optional piece, as we've said, uh, is a, a, some type of SNMP agent. That gives you the ability to more easily read and interpret IPSLA reporting. Some of those agents, not going to be too surprised to see some of these listed here. Some of the things that we've mentioned previously, solar winds, PRTG, and a different one that you might have heard of is NIGOS Core. But there are many, many SNMP monitoring tools on the market. They're going to give us that intuitive reporting from a central location. So let's look at how we can configure basic IPSLA to monitor network connectivity. Here we can see a, a really basic topology. In this particular example, we're not going to use an IPSLA responder. So we're going to create a basic configuration that will use the ICMP echo function to check for reachability of a device that's on our network. So now if we're talking about exploring all of the features of IPSLA, they are vast. That would encompass its own video series. But in regard to the Cisco blueprint requirement, what we wanna know about is how to configure basic IPSLA and where you can find additional options. So you can see here, we have a server at 10.0.0.6. We're going to create a very simple IPSLA to check on the connectivity status of the server. And that will allow us to be alerted if the device becomes unreachable. So let's do that. Let's go out to our command line interface. We can see our topology here. We're on router one. And let's say we want to see what type of IPSLA configuration is supported on our device because it can vary from device to device. So we can say show IP SLA application to see that. And we can see our supported operation types that are listed here. Uh, not all of the SLA operations are supported again on every single device. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, now we're on router one. Let's go under global configuration mode. And for this, let's start with the command IP SLA, followed by contextual help. We need to give this first off an entry number. We see that option at the top. Each IP SLA probe that we configure has to have its own individual entry number to identify it. So let's use one in this case. We'll hit enter. Now you'll see we're under IPSLA configuration mode on the router. If we look at our, config, uh, our contextual help options again, you can see all of our available operations that we can configure. Now, since we're gonna use this to test basic reachability to our server, I'm gonna use the keyword ICMP-echo, and I need to follow that with the IP address for the destination that I want to monitor. And that, of course, in my case, is the server at 10.0.0.6. If we look at contextual help again, we have a couple of different options here. We can specify the source IP address. So if we want to specifically mark these ICMP packets being from a particular source, we can do that. Or we can specify a source interface as well. We also can just leave it as the base configuration. We don't have to specify these options. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not going to bother, and I'm just going to hit enter to continue. So notice now we're under IP SLA echo configuration mode. If we look at contextual help here, you can see that we have quite a few options here. I'm going to start with frequency, and this is going to allow me to set how often this IP SLA probe runs, and help is going to indicate this is going to be set in seconds. So maybe we want this to run every three minutes. In my case, in order for us to see some results in our output pretty quickly in this lab environment, I'm just gonna set it really low. I'm just gonna set it to 10 seconds. And I wanna hit enter. Now you could of course configure any additional sub commands you want. If you wanna set thresholds or timeouts, you can just run those commands here. But in my case, we're gonna leave it right there. And I'm going to back out to global configuration mode. And now that we have our IP SLA configured, we need to actually start the probe. If we say IP SLA and we look at contextual help, near the bottom, 
we see the option for schedule. Second to last option is schedule. So let's use that. And that's going to allow us to schedule the parameters for each of our IP SLA operations. We need to follow that with the operation number or the entry number. Remember our entry number is one. Help again indicates some options for when this probe should start and how long it should operate. So let's first say start hyphen time. Under here, we can see a few things. We can set this probe to start after a certain amount of time. So maybe after five minutes from now, we can set a very specific start time, even down to seconds. We can set it as pending, lots of things we can do. In my case, I wanted to start immediately. So I'm going to say now. Further look at our contextual help options. We can say recurring, that's an option we can use. If we wanna run this option, let's say we wanna run it every day in a daily manner, and we can age out the operation from memory after a certain amount of time, uh, or set a lifetime value. I'm gonna say life, and if we look at those options, you can see that by default, using the life command, we'll set the life of this probe to one hour. The default here is 3,600 seconds, or we can say forever, which in my case is what I'm going to use. Now, when I hit enter, you're going to see what we're going to see an error here. And you can see that it's listed as in recurring mode, the lifetime cannot be equal or more than a day. So that's something you can be aware of. If we're wanting to run this recurring in that manner, it's redundant to set the lifetime more than one day. So basically this is telling you that these commands kind of cancel each other out. You don't need both of them. One of those is unnecessary. So I'm gonna remove this recurring keyword and hit enter to accept that. Now, if we back out and I say show IPSLA configuration, followed by my configuration number, which is of course one, we can see that in our output. We see that, uh, again, this is entry number one up at the top. We see our uh, type of operation here, ICMP echo. We see the target address 10.0.0.6. If we scroll down a bit, we're gonna see the operation frequency in the number of seconds, 10 seconds. We can see that the start time, if we take a look at that, uh, where did that go on me? You see the lifetime value there. Uh, oh, there we go. Next scheduled start time. It was right underneath my nose. The next scheduled start time is listed as start time already passed. In other words, this probe is running. So that's good. It's up and going. And we see that that the life is forever, the age out is never. If we run the command show IPSLA statistics and hit enter, we can see we already have some information in here. We see a more basic output that tells us a little bit more about this. And we see also additionally that we have a number of successes, li uh, successes listed as well as our last return code, our latest round trip time as well. Our last return code, we see that's listed as okay. In other words, the last ICMP message was successfully over there. So that's good. We see our number again of successes, eight, zero failures. Uh, and then as a matter of fact, if I continue to run this, if I run it again, because this probe is continuing to run, we see our successes continue to increment up. So that's good. Now what I want to do is I want to actually mimic a condition where the server is unreachable. So let's go over to router two and let's go under global configuration mode under interface gig zero slash two, which you can see connects over to the server. Let's just say shut to shut down this port. So now we have closed down the interface where the server is connected. The server is unreachable by our IP SLA probe. The IP SLA is still trying to send those over, but now it's sending out SNMP trap messages about the failure through syslog. So those would be handled by a syslog server and we can alert uh, an administrator if we want to, depending on how we've configured that. So let's go to router one. Let's arrow up 
and run our show command again for our statistics. This time you'll see now we have three failures. We have our last operation return code was a timeout. Not a lot of information here, but we do see that it is a failure. So a good syslog server is going to be much more helpful when we're alerting about IPSLA violations. It's going to help us gather more information. And of course, if we continue to run that, we're going to continue to see our failures because of that interface that's closed down. So that's a look at a basic IPSLA, uh, pardon me, tongue twister, IPSLA configuration using the ICMP echo function to monitor the reachability of a particular network device. So let me take a quick look at our time here and see where we're landing because I don't want to run out of too much time. Yeah, I think I wanna go to, let's jump down to BGP multi-hop because I do, before our time is up, I do wanna get into some BGP. So let's talk about what, it, what multi hop means, what multi hop has the ability to overcome. Now, by default, when we use eBGP, external BGP, that requires two Cisco routers to be directly connected. If not, then they're going to fail to form a neighbor adjacency. Why is that? Well, the reason is that because eBGP, by default, has a TTL value, a time to live value of one. And each time a packet traverses through a device, the TTL value is going to be decremented by one. So that means with a TTL value of one, it crosses a device, it goes to zero, the packet gets dropped. So you can see in the instance of this example topology, router one and router three, the BGP routers are not directly connected. So the packet's going to be discarded. So that's what we're seeing here. Router one in autonomous system 65100, router 3 and 65200. In the middle, we have router 2, which is a non-BGP router. Now, in a special case like this, where we have two eBGP routers not directly connected, we need to use eBGP multi-hop. And I will also point out that this command is only used with eBGP, external BGP, not iBGP internal BGP. So let's jump into a terminal now and let's take a look at how we can overcome that using BGP multi-hop. Let's go out to that. We've got our same topology here that we just saw in our slides. So first things first, on R1 and R3, I'm just gonna create a couple of static routes to make sure that they are reachable with each other. So I'm gonna go under, not under that. Let's go under global configuration mode. And let's say IP route to 20.1.1.1, all 255 subnet mask, and the next hop address, 10.1.1.1. That is the IP address on router two to which we're connected. Let's do something similar on R3, global configuration mode, IP route, 10.1.1.2 with our subnet mask and the next hop interface, 20.1.1.1. Let's exit here. Let's go back to router one. Let's do a quick ping, make sure we can reach that. 20.1.1.2. And I think I've configured something wrong. Let's see here. Yep, I definitely did. All right, here we go. Some live troubleshooting. So I IP route. Oh, I see what I did. I have the wrong. I have the wrong IP address in my static IP route. So let's just go and remove this. And I want to say IP route 20.1.1.2, not one. Okay. 
And now let's give it a try, see if that fixes our problems. Oh yeah, that fixes it for us. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's ping. Yep, we're good. All right, so we got a couple of static routes. We're able to reach each router. And let's go into R1 here. Let's create our BGP instance. Let's say router BGP 65100. Let's set a neighbor 20.1.1.2. That is router three in remote autonomous system 65200. Similar on router three. I'll just clear off some space here for us so as not to be confusing. Router BGP. And we want this one to be 65200. Our neighbor command will be pointing to 10.1.1.2 over at router one, remote autonomous system, 65100. Now that's a normal, correct BGP configuration in most cases, right? If these were directly connected, no problem. But if we break out of here and I say show IP BGP pipe to section begin external. And I need to say show IP BGP neighbors. There we go. You'll notice that our BGP state listed here is idle. You see, we're in the idle state. In other words, we haven't established a BGP connection. Uh, if we scroll on down here, we'll see some more information about that. And we see that external BGP neighbor is not directly connected. We see that explicitly listed. So we can see we've ran into an issue where our TTL has expired and we're not able to become eBGP neighbors. Again, we can overcome that through eBGP multi-hop. So let's configure that. Back on R1, let's go, I'm already under my router BGP 65100 configuration mode. So let's increase our TTL value so that our BGP packets can reach router three. Let's replace our neighbor command, or not replace it, but let's add an additional instance here. Let's say neighbor 20.1.1.2. And I want to say eBGP multi-hop, and we'll follow that with an optional integer at the end that determines how many hops we want to use. Now you can see we can use any hop count from one to 255, but it's important to note here that if you don't specify a TTL value, it's going to default to a TTL value of 255. It's gonna to go to the highest. So it's a best practice to set this exactly to the TTL that you need, or at least really close to it, in order to reach your non-directly connected BGP router. That's a security reason that we do that, so that we're not passing around traffic unnecessarily to the wrong place. So I'm gonna set that in my case to a TTL value of two, and hit enter to complete that. Back on router three, let's go under router BGP 65200, and something similar, neighbor 10.1.1.2, We'll say eBGP multi-hop. I'm gonna set that hop to two. Now, if I break out of here and we see our adjacency form, our neighbor is up, so we already have a good sign. Let's say show IP BGP neighbors. Now we see our BGP state is set right here as established, exactly what we would want to see. So that's great. It looks like near the middle of this output. If we do a couple of more space bars here, one more thing I wanna show you. Now we see explicitly stated external BGP neighbors may be up to two hops away. So if you're using eBGP multi-hop and you're troubleshooting something, you're troubleshooting your sessions, you definitely wanna make sure that your TTL is adequate for the number of hops that you need to travel through in order to reach your other BGP peer. So that's good. Now, if we look at the top of the show command, again, we'll see that our session is, of course, established. We see the uptime from the time that I read this. And we saw those messages pop into our console as well. So a very simple way that we can use BGP multi-hop 
to traverse a non BGP router in the network. It's possible that you have a router at the edge of the autonomous system that might not support BGP, or maybe it's at the edge of an autonomous system that you're trying to connect to and you need to pass through that router to get to another BGP router. That's certainly possible. And that's a case where we might use eBGP multi-hop in the real world. All right, great stuff. Let's talk about route reflectors now. Let's take a look at why we might need a BGP route reflector, and then we'll take a look at how we can configure that. We have four routers in this particular topology. We have router one that you can see is in autonomous system 65100. We have routers two, three, and four in a separate autonomous system 65200. Now I've already configured BGP for this particular network, so that's all done. I have a very basic BGP configuration. It contains both eBGP and iBGP neighbor adjacencies. So let's first talk about the way that iBGP neighbors work. By default, a BGP enabled router, when it receives an iBGP route, in other words, if we learn a route from a different router that is within our own autonomous system, we're not going to advertise that to any other router that lies within our own autonomous system. And maybe a little bit confusing the way that I worded that, but we can see this probably a lot better if we jump into a topology and take a look at this in action. So let's look at this route reflector example. If we go to router two and I say show IP BGP, we of course see our BGP learned routes. We see, notice in our topology, there is a loopback address on router one the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network. We do know about that on router two. We've learned about it. And because this was learned from another autonomous system outside of the autonomous system that router two lives in, router two will advertise that over to router three. We can verify that, of course, by going to router three and saying show IP BGP. We can see that we do, in fact, have knowledge of that exact same network. So R2 shared that information with router three because it learned about it from a different autonomous system. Also notice the lowercase i that we see at the beginning. You can see from the status codes listed here that this is an internal advertisement. See that? The I at the beginning means this is an IBGP advertisement. That means the route will not be advertised to any of the other neighbors inside this autonomous system. So that means R4 should not know about the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network. Let's see that. Let's verify. We want to say show IP BGP on router four. And you can see that Definitely, we have no knowledge of that route. Also notice the 20.1.1.0 slash 30 network is also missing. That's the network between R1 and R2. Why is that missing? Well, it, the exact same scenario, right? Router 3 learned about that route. If we go back to Router 3, Router 3 knows about it. How did it learn about it? It learned about it from R2 but router three is not going to advertise this route to any other routers within its own autonomous system, which is of course the only remaining router, router four. R3 learned about it from an IBGP neighbor, which is R2, so it's not going to pass those on. Now you might be thinking, well, can't we just really easily fix this by making R2 and R4 neighbors? Can't we just create a full mesh within the Autonomous system 65200, uh, where all the routers are talking to one another. Definitely, we could do that, but scale that up. Let's assume we have dozens and dozens of routers in a service provider cloud. That's not scalable whatsoever. So what we can do instead is to use a route reflector. Specifically here, we're going to configure router three as a route reflector a BGP route reflector. When we do that, any routes that we learn from an iBGP neighbor on router three 
we can reflect those routes to other routers within the same autonomous system. So this means that the routes we see missing from router four, we can actually send those over to that router. And also any routes learned from R4 would likewise be reflected over to R2. Now in this topology, there's no case where that would happen, but if R4 also had some networks hanging off of its side, we could also, that also means that R2 would additionally be pop, uh, pardon me, populated. So it's a great solution to do that. Really easy to configure. Let's go to R3. Let's go under, let me clear off a little bit of screen real estate for us. Let's go under global configuration mode. We'll say router BGP 65200. And we're going to issue an additional neighbor statement for each neighbor on router three. And when we do that, we're additionally going to say that each of these neighbors is a route reflector client. In other words, it's going to receive route reflections. So let's say neighbor, let's start with R2, 30.1.1.1. And the option we want to say is route hyphen reflector hyphen client. Very, very simple, that's it. And we can do the same thing for R4 as well. Neighbor 40.1.1.2 route hyphen reflector, hyphen client, we'll hit enter. And I'll also point out, notice we're getting console messages stating that our previous adjacencies go down and our BGP session is rebuilt. So something important to note if you ever do this in production. So let's go ahead and before we take a look at our BGP table, one thing I like to do here is, uh, in, in the lab anyway, just to speed things up, I like to go ahead and clear all of the BGP sessions on the routers just to make sure we're not seeing obsolete information. So here, let's say clear IP BGP asterisk. We'll do the same on router two and router three. Again, not a good idea to do in production, but I like to do that here in the lab just to speed things up and to make sure we're not looking at any old information. So. We'll give that a bit of time. We do see our adjacencies coming back up. Here on R4, let's see if we've learned about our two additional networks yet. We just saw our neighbor adjacency come up, so it might take a bit more time. Let's say show IP BGP. And it looks like we're still waiting on our neighbor adjacency here. So we don't have all of our information just yet on router three. So we'll give it a little bit more time here to finish propagating. Now we see the 30 network here on router two. Let's see what we have on R3 now. That's looking much better. Let's check R4. And finally, there we go. We finally had our information come in. Took a little bit of time to populate. We had to run it a few times, but we finally see our information. We see our two additional networks that we previously did not know about. We see the 10.1.1.0 slash 24 network and the 20.1.1.0 slash 30 network. Those are being reflected to router four from router three. So that's a quick look at why we would use a BGP route reflector and how we can very easily configure that. Okay, let's carry on with some more BGP and let's talk about route summarization, otherwise known as BGP aggregation. So we call it both terms. You might see it referred to as the BGP aggregate address because that is actually the nomenclature that we use in Cisco IOS, we actually configure an aggregate address here. So our topology, you can see we have router one in autonomous system 65100, and we have two 
uh, pardon me, other routers. I did not label those, it looks like, but those are routers two and router three in autonomous system 65200. Now on the far right router, which will be router three, you can see that each of our, we have four additional networks, I should say. Each of these are represented by a loopback address on this particular router. We have networks 10.10.0.0 through 10.10.3.0, and those are all slash 24 networks. These are all also within autonomous system 65200. R2, which is in the middle, R2 connects to R1 over the 20.1.1.0 slash 24 network. R2 in this case, that means it's going to be our autonomous system edge router. It sits at the edge of autonomous system 65200. This router, router two, right in the middle, that's going to be where we aggregate all of our networks in a summary address. In other words, router two is going to provide route summarization from autonomous system 65200 over to autonomous system 65100. So let's go into our CLI and clarify this a bit. You can see our topology here. And in this case, in this topology file that I have this image, it is, it is labeled. I apologize for router two and router three not being uh, labeled earlier, but regardless, let's go to router three here. And let's do a quick show IP interface brief. And as I mentioned, you can see our, of course, our gig zero slash zero interface connects us over to R2. And additionally, I mentioned our four loopback addresses that I have configured. Each one of those is assigned into a different 10.10 .10 network, 10.10.0.0 .10 through 10.10.3.0. If we go over to R2 at the moment and say show IP BGP, you'll see that we only know about our network connecting us to router one and our network connecting us over to router three. And that's because we have not advertised our loopback networks into BGP yet using network statements. So let's do that. Let's go to router three and let's go under global configuration mode under router BGP 65200. So we haven't yet looked in this particular live webinar, at least how to advertise into BGP. And to do that, we use a network statement. And you can see in our topology, our first network is 10.10.0.0. Now, as opposed to maybe when you're configuring an IP route, if you're not familiar with BGP, you do need to say mask here, followed by the subnet mask. And you can see in our topology in the top right corner, this is a slash 24 subnet mask. In other words, 255.255.255.0. So that's our first loopback. Let's take care of our other four loopbacks now. Network 10.10.1.0, same mask. Network 10.10.2.0, same mask. And finally, network 10.10.3.0 and the same mask. Now, let's end this here, break out of that, and let's say show IP BGP here on router three. Now, that is just to verify that we are in fact advertising these four prefixes into BGP. We do see those listed there, so that looks good. Let's go to R2. Let's make sure that we can see these. By the way, I'll mention again, R2 is the edge router for autonomous system 65200. So when we're performing summarization, BGP route summarization, we want to use our autonomous system edge router to do that. We want to go to the very edge of our autonomous system. So let's see if we can see these. Let's say show IP BGP to take a look at our BGP table. And in fact, we do just as we would want to see, we see our four prefixes for those four loopback networks. So that's good. So now let's summarize these. 
or in other words, let's aggregate our routes and let's advertise those to our neighboring autonomous system, which is 65100. That's where router one lives. Now, in order to do that, we of course need to know how to calculate the correct summary route address. Now, there are obviously various calculators online that will do this for you, but it is an important skill to understand exactly how this works. So I do want to briefly cover that here. The first thing we wanna do is to convert all of our network addresses to a binary value. And you can see those binary equivalents in this particular table. And what we wanna look for are the common bits. In other words, how many bits do these network addresses all have that are exactly the same? How many bits are identical? In this case, we can see that we have 22 bits in common. We have the first 16 bits followed by an additional six bits for a total of 22 bits. So that means our network addresses are going to share the first 22 bits. They have the first 22 bits in common. So that would mean a 10.10.0.0 network with a slash 22 mask. In other words, 255.255.252.0. That particular network and subnet mask will summarize all four of these networks for us. And that's the address that we can use as our aggregate address to advertise those routes over to router one. So let's do that. Let's go back into our CLI. And now let's go over to, let's see here. Where do I wanna go? Let's go back under router two. Yeah, I'm already there. So we mentioned router two is our autonomous system edge router. That's where we wanna perform our summarization. So let's go clear off a little space. Global configuration mode, router BGP, 65200. That's our autonomous system number. And the keyword we want to use is aggregate hyphen address. And we want to follow that with the summary address that we calculated, which was 10.10.0.0 and our mask 255.255.252.0. In other words, a slash 22 mask. We'll hit enter. That's it. Simple as that. Let's break out of here and let's say show IP BGP. And we do of course see our four original prefixes listed inside of here. This is our local BGP table. We of course see our 10.10.0.0, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, all slash 24. And we additionally see our aggregate address, 10.10.0.0 slash 22. We see that in our BGP table. So that's exactly what we would expect to see. Let's go to R1 and let's verify the local BGP table in this autonomous system, in autonomous system 65100. We'll say show IP BGP. Now, notice we do see our aggregate address here, 10.10.0.0 slash 22, but we also still see all of our slash 24 networks. So not only are we seeing our summary address, but we're seeing those individual prefixes as well. What's going on here? Well, we actually need to go back and suppress those on our edge router. We need to suppress those so that they are not advertised out to this autonomous system. So let's do that. Back on R2, we'll go under global configuration mode, router BGP 65200. And let's use a different variation of our aggregate command. If we arrow up, you can see our original command, aggregate hyphen address 10.10.0.0 slash 24 mask. But this time at the end, let's append the keyword summary hyphen only. And what this is going to do, it's going to suppress all of those prefixes that are being summarized and only advertise our aggregate 
address. Let's hit enter. Let's go back to R1. Let's verify this again by saying show IP BGP. Now take a look at that. Now this time we only see the aggregate address 10.10.0.0 slash 22. That is of course coming from the next hop, which is router 2 20.1.1.2. So that's great. That's exactly what we would expect to see. And look how much that's cleaned up our BGP table. So of course it wasn't huge. Our original table wasn't exactly huge, but you're talking about three routers here. Scale that up and imagine you have a really, really large lab environment or even a really large enterprise environment. Think about how much that's going to save you. It's going to make it so much easier to parse through that information. Uh, something else that I want to look at here, let's say, um, let's go back to R2. Yeah, that because I did want to point that out. Back on R2, let me break out of this and let's say show IP BGP. Because you'll notice that, again, those individual prefixes are still in our table. But now at the beginning, we see this code that is an S. What is that S status code? Well, our status code here tells us that this means this is being suppressed. These particular networks are not being advertised over to the other autonomous system, just as we would expect to see. Back on R1, one more show command. Let's look specifically at show IP BGP 10.10.0.0. Slash 22, and let's look specifically at this prefix because this will give us some more detailed information. We can see here that this was aggregated by 65200. So the aggregating device is in that autonomous system. That's good information to know. And we see that uh, the this particular router that aggregated it, router 2, we see its IP address. I did not set a BGP router ID for that. Now, one more thing I want to note here is this atomic hyphen aggregate. This is one of the attributes of BGP. It's an optional attribute, uh, or pardon me, it's one of our well-known discretionary attributes, and that is used to inform router one or any other BGP routers that this actual route technically does not exist. It's just a generated route that is representing a contiguous group of addresses. So that's a look at BGP summarization, how that's used, and very simply, how we configure that. I hope you enjoyed the replay of this CCNP Enterprise live webcast. Just as a reminder, if you're interested in the topics covered here, I would love to have you in my two week long Encore 350-401 Masterclass Live Course. Here's everything included in that product. You can see our session times start Monday, July 18th from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. each day. And you can find these session times again later using the link that we're going to provide here. I'll be your instructor during this two week live course encompassing six sessions, as you just saw with the schedule, three hours per session, for a total of 18 hours of live training on every topic listed on the Encore 350-401 exam blueprint. So you get 18 hours of structured live training over the course of two weeks. You also retain lifetime access to these recordings available to watch at any time, regardless of whether or not you're able to make it to a particular live session. So if you miss a session, no worries. We'll post replays within 24 hours of each class. Additionally, we know there are students with bandwidth concerns whom we've heard from or who like to watch training on the transit or on a plane. So we're also providing the ability to download every session recording for offline use. You also get access to viral and CML based lab files for hands on practice. There's a course introduction module where Kevin actually walks you through a free option for using these files, leveraging the Cisco DevNet sandbox version of CML. It's a great, great free resource for home labbing that is completely sufficient for CCNP studies provided by the great folks at DevNet.
You'll also get downloadable PDFs of all the course slides so you can review those as necessary and use those for your notes to memorize certain topics and two Encore practice exams. You can use these in our online exam engine where you'll have access to a multiple choice test that gets graded for you. And we also provide detailed answers and explanations in PDF format because we wanna make sure you understand the topics covered and why a particular answer is correct. Also, as always, we have a 100% money back guarantee. If you attend the first session and you decide, you know, this just isn't for me, then no worries. All you have to do is email us before the second session and we'll refund 100% of your purchase price and drop you from the course. So there's absolutely no risk involved. I hope to see you starting Monday, July 18th for the first session of my Encore 350-401 Masterclass Live. Again, dates, times, and enrollment information can be found using the link on the screen and in the video description. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in the classroom soon.